Would you mind introducing yourselves? After you. <laughs> so I'm Red Riding Brat or Louise. I'm Will, um, or Will Hunt. Not very inventive with names. Okay, and could you, could you describe your relationship to me? You first, let's see if you get it right. <laughs> um, so, we are in uh, own a property dynamic, so he owns me. Yeah, um, <laughs> might also be kind of referred to as 24-7DS, which effectively means that our DS or dominant submissive dynamic is very much an underpinning aspect of our relationship. So rather than it, it's kind of like we have a relationship and we are sometimes kinky, it's more that we are in a kinky relationship. How do you blend that into your real life? Because uh, I, I, you live together, right? I have rules and expectations surrounding kind of like everyday things. So things like I have to ask to sit on the sofa or I'm not allowed to wear trousers, I have to wear skirts and little things that aren't necessarily kinky but they underpin everyday situations that some of them happen daily, some of them not quite so often, but we do apply the kink relationship to non-kink situations. So in our relationship, we have a, a dynamic of consensual inequality. So by having rules which are disproportionately burdensome on her, so you have to follow these rules, you have to ask for permission, etc, etc. It, in a way, reinforces and maintains that disparity of power within the relationship. And so in that way, there's practical things that are done, that are expected, that remind both of us and maintain that disparity in power within our dynamic. Are there any challenges to keeping that up full time? Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm chronically ill and quite often physically I'm not in a very good place so I require a lot more leniency because my body I'm either extremely fatigued or I can't do a lot of physical activity so that is kind of one of the major challenges so in those kind of situations we do kind of take a small step back we still have certain rules that remain in place, but quite a few of them do kind of get stripped back to the bare minimum. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think what we all have is we have the expectations which are proportional to the ability. So rather than have a cookie cutter idea of this is the shape you must fit at all times, we have a flexibility which is practical. So here is almost like your base level of expected rules. And here's what you're expected to do when you're able to, and this is kind of when you're absolutely fine. And those kind of scale in that way. One of the big things is remembering the rules. Because it can be um, it can be the lazy top that basically tells the bottom in their relationship, here are all these rules, so you must follow them. And then forgets them. So that's not really the way to do it. At the top, it's my job to also remember all those rules so that I know when she hasn't followed them. So in a way, the onus is on both of us to remember what the rules are and why they're there and to treat them with a certain degree of respect as well. And the way that they're respected by her is by following them. And the way they're respected by me is remembering them and enforcing them. And so by having that consistency within the relationship, it also provides a certain degree of safety because she knows that when I say something, I mean it. There's a trust aspect in the consistency <clears throat> of the rules being enforced and always being present and that I think provides a certain degree of safety and security at the same time as we said they aren't static beyond reason no there are certain sense where they won't work and that's okay and we adapt to those so there's a great deal of communication that also happens because of that when you say communication is that a case of you have an explicit conversation or is it something which is quite intuitive it very much depends on the situation. There are some points where we do have explicit sit down conversations where we are, when we come together, kind of more as equals than kind of subdom. 
but also there are times when we do just chat and sit and talk about it and ensure that things are communicated. We're both very big talkers, we, we don't hide anything from each other, we never have done, so it's definitely something that we try and make sure that we continue to happen. Yeah, the explicit communication when we do check in and kind of say, how are you doing? How are things going? I also think that's really important when you're introducing rules into a relationship is to kind of go back to those rules and examine, are they achieving what you want them to achieve? Are they a positive thing in the relationship? Are they something that is actually adding value or benefit? And so I think explicit communication can be really valuable. And then also it's important to kind of watch the other person, kind of see how they are dealing with something. Because where possible you want to try and, if if you can, kind of get ahead of something. You want to stop something before it becomes bad or ask someone how they're doing before they kind of get to a point where they feel they have to come and tell you because something is wrong. So you want to, if you can, be a little over courses maybe when exploring rules and DS dynamics and kind of check in with each other. And that's an absolutely okay thing to do. Um, just to circle back to something you said, you mentioned uh, rules achieving what you want them to achieve. Can you give me an example of uh, what you want to achieve with a rule? Okay. Um, so, for example, let's touch on one of the rules that um, she spoke about, which is the not sitting on the sofa without asking to sit on the sofa. Now, very much the objective of that rule is, as we spoke about, that maintaining of inequality within the dynamic of a relationship. And so very much the purpose of that rule is to remind her that there are things that people would expect to normally just be a normal thing that you wouldn't have to ask about. And that, you know, is in common society not an issue. But for her, because of our relationship, because of our dynamic, she has to ask and that it won't always be yes. And so very much the object of that rule is simply as a persistent reminder of the fact that the option of yes or no is always there for me. And that way the inequality is maintained, it's highlighted in a very kind of relaxed way. I mean, I would say probably 80% of the time you're allowed on the sofa, <laughs> but that 20% of the time is that very practical conscious reminder of the fact that no, there is an inequality and that I don't need a reason, I can just say no. How do you enforce rules, generally speaking? So, <clears throat> um, we have a standard kind of punishment for if any of these rules get broken, um, 100 strikes, and that is for every single rule. That's kind of to say that no rule is more important or less important than another, because he set them, therefore the expectation is I follow all of them, no matter how big or how small. Um, I'm very honest, so if I mess up, I will come to him and say, I've messed up, because it's less of an issue if I try and hide things. Again, that circles all the way back to communication being incredibly important in our relationship. But it's also up to him to kind of notice if something happens it's not meant to happen so if I absentmindedly sit on the sofa for example because I've been out at a friend's house all day and therefore been sitting on a sofa it's up to him to kind of go oh you're sat on the sofa to make sure that the rules are enforced so there are two ways with rules there's positive reinforcement and there's negative consequence so there is the negative consequence aspect, which is, you know, you break a rule, 100 strikes, doesn't matter on the rule, there's no internalised valuation of rules. It's not like she can make a calculation, therefore, that like, oh, well, that rule is less important than that rule because it gets a less severe punishment. It's all consistent because a rule is a rule. They're all important. But then there's the positive affirma affirmation aspect of it as well. So, for example, the sitting on the sofa rule, if she's not allowed to sit on the sofa, she sits on the floor, it isn't a punishment that she's sitting on the floor. Often I'll fuss her hair, give her strokes, she'll get lots of attention. So there's a positive reinforcement of following the rule as well. So you have the constant kind of threat of punishment for breaking a rule, but positive reinforcement of following the rules. And so 
the idea is that for her, not sitting on the sofa is not a punishment. Following the rule is actually rewarded. And she gets you know, head fusses and attention when she's on the floor as well. So it's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing to follow the rules. It's only a negative thing if you break the rules. Um, you mentioned about consistency. How, how often do your rules get changed or added to? Our rules haven't changed for a while. I said it's quite often that you know, I'll get sick, therefore there's a lot more leniency in certain rules we've discussed aren't enforced. But other than that, there's not much change to them. You know, we want to make sure that there's chance for me to <clears throat> catch up and learn and do the new behaviour and have it ingrained as opposed to having constant change and constant additions because there's only so much a human brain can acknowledge and take on especially if the object of the rules is long-term behaviour change rather than short-term. Um, yeah so rules that are brought in we kind of have almost like an acclimatization period we brought in a new rule quite recently and you basically had three days of oh, yeah. kind of just getting used to it and me just highlighting when she'd missed the rule rather than there being a punishment or anything like that and then it's kind of moved on to like a three strikes and you're out type situation and so there is almost a breaking in period to let her get used to something because the objective is not to play with rules it's not like we're in the bedroom so now these are the rules it is these are the rules throughout your life you want them to develop into patterns of behavior over time and so in that way having a rule and consistency just working with that rule and that rule get embedded and be comfortable and repeated you don't want to bring like five rules in at the same time and you don't want to bring in a new rule every week so i'd probably say we probably don't bring in a new rule more than once every three or four months at most, really. And when our relationship first started, there probably were more rules more quickly because we're setting the base of our dynamic and there was also a lot more punishments because there was a lot more for you to remember. But now we have the set rules, they are consistent, they have been pretty much from the beginning of our relationship and new rules are brought in very carefully and in very considered ways. And also kind of when we had that kind of influx of new rules, <coughs> at the start of our relationship, they were relatively similar rules. So there was quite a few that were based on my appearance, for example. So it was things like not having chip nail polish, wearing skirts, making sure that shoes are always kind of like not worn down, not having anything threadbare, not having ladders in stockings, making sure you wear stockings, not tights. But because they were all so similar, it wasn't as much of a burden to learn and take on. I think very much because the objective of the rules is to form the basis of the relationship and to form the basis of the dynamic and the way for her to behave. It isn't for her to fail. I don't want her to mess up with the rules. I don't need an excuse to punish her. I, so I'm not looking to give her difficult rules that I'm working against her with, I'm working with her on them. I want her to be able to follow them. I want her to learn to follow them. I want her to do positive things. And so in that way, I'm not trying to catch her out either. I'm not trying to set difficult rules so that I have an excuse to cane her. Yeah, we have a, we have a saying in the relationship that he hurts me because he wants to, not because I've been bad. And that's something that's really important in the relationship. Yeah. On the kind of sadist masochist side, I think it's really important to distinguish what's kind of like a punishment because she's broken a rule and what's me just having fun because I'm a bad person. And it's really important that she never feels any sort of guilt for the fact that I'm a sadist and she's a masochist. That's not about her being punished for breaking a rule. That is entirely separate. So I'll often very much highlight that. That, you know, you haven't done anything wrong. You don't deserve this. I just have issues. And that's just really, really... I try and make that super clear. So many issues. 